Good morning, everyone. The anti-Black violence events of the past months remind us once again of the structural racism and systemic inequality that are pervasive in our society, in academia and our institute. Whatever we have done is clearly not enough. We need to go beyond to increase diversity and build a community through inclusion. At the Zuckerman Institute, diversity and inclusion is one of our pillars. And so this is a time to act, not to measure just intentions, but to measure impact. And we need to work with our community to fight bad structure with good structure. It's a time to build structures that go beyond what we have done. Um, and it is a time for listening. This has been a week of listening uh, and a week of learning. We had Dr. Dana Crawford talk on Tuesday about concrete methods to learn uh, to fight bias and racism. And then later on Tuesday, we had the first meeting of the Zuckerman Institute's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion uh, Board. And importantly, today, we have a town hall to listen and learn about structural racism and to ask the questions, what can we do? How can we act? This town hall uh, will feature uh, Professor G.J. Williams and Professor Bob Fully Love, and will be moderated by Paula Croxon, our director, uh, associate director of public programs at the Zuckerman Institute. Uh, many of you may know Professor Williams, He's the co-director with Professor Sidney Hankerson of the Columbia Wellness Center that is here in our institute. And he's a professor and chief of staff at the Department of Neurology. He is a um, world-renowned expert in, 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 in stroke and in stroke disparities and in community-based uh, behavioral intervention research. He's also the founder and chair of Hip Hop Public Health, which is an internationally recognized organization that creates and implements multimedia public health interventions that target not only young people, uh, but also their families and uh, communities in terms of health uh, disparity. Professor Robert Fullilove is a historical figure in our community and he's a professor and associate dean for community and minority affairs at the mailman school and has a long time history of civil rights activism uh, he actually worked with dr king he's expert in structural racism and um, uh, minority disparities and he's the co-director of the cities research group has served in many committees. And he's a wonderful teacher uh, with an honorary degree, um, a doctorate from uh, Barnett College of Education, and he has won many um, teaching awards. How did this come about? When, when these events came to light, um, and I didn't know much what to do, except that our responses had been inadequate, I reached out to Gide and the first thing he told me is, Rui, I, I have not slept for five days. And, and I asked, what, what can we do? And he said, let us start with a town hall. Let us talk openly, let us learn, and let us ask concrete questions about how to act. And this is what we're doing here today. So please join me in welcoming Bob, Gide, and, and, and Paula, to this forum and in thanking them so much for doing this. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Bob, Gide. Thank you so much for joining us for this event today. I know Rui already said this, but um, it's really um, so incredible of you to spend your time and energy 
um, with us this morning. Um, and um, yeah, I'm hoping that we can start a conversation um, today um, that will last for a very long time. Um, and um, I think Bob, you might be the best person uh, to, to start us off. Um, so um, I, I'd, I'd like to ask you, I mean, you've been working on structural racism for, for your whole career since, since at least the 60s, I think. Um, and um, I, want to, I want to ask you um, to tell us about some of the driving factors that you think have caused it to be so pervasive in society. Maybe the most important lesson to be learned from studies of structural racism is that it's not a function of whether or not we as individuals treat each other correctly. A lot of folk have looked at the events that have been transpiring over the last couple of weeks and months and have felt that this was a call for them to behave better, to acknowledge the existence of their black friends, to make sure that all the folk of color with whom they work know that I'm not a racist. That's very useful, it's very helpful. But structural racism makes it clear that what we're dealing with is not something that is related to interpersonal behavior, it's about the system. It's about the structures in which we exist. Racism is not just about individual feelings and emotions. It's about the ways in which the benefits of living in a particular society are allocated based on your membership in a particular group. You've heard a lot of conversation in the last couple of weeks about white privilege. That's a way of sort of understanding how systemic racism really work. It affords privileges to some and denies them to others. What's so important for those of us in medicine and public health is that denial is what is often at the core of the social drivers of health that we are likely to encounter in everything from obesity, cardiovascular disease, to HIV AIDS. So the idea that what we're doing as an institution, what we're doing as a medical, ce as a medical center, and what we're doing just as citizens of the United States is to figure out in what ways must we dismantle the drivers of this system so that, amongst other things, advantages are equally distributed. That, I think, is the core of our work. Change your individual emotions, but let's figure out how to dismantle something that has basically been res the result of all the morbidity and mortality that we've associated with COVID-19. Right, right. Yes. Thank you, Bob. I think that's a, that's a really great introduction. I mean, what do you think in the last um, 50 years, what do you think has changed and what do you think has stayed the same? What have you seen change since then? Let me try not to give a long-winded answer. 53 years ago, I was doing organizing in housing projects in Newark, New Jersey. That's where I was raised. That's where my dad practiced medicine. 53 years ago, Newark was struggling with issues related to urban renewal. And as a consequence, pressures that had been building for years resulted when, once again, police were responsible for provoking a set of situations, the beating and arrest of a cab driver, that drove members of the Black community of Newark to just levels of outrage that are probably, if you travel through Newark, are still with us today. That was one of the ways in which I sort of understood that what we were dealing with was a set of circumstances that had everything to do with the manner in which we organize life in our cities and everything to do with the fact that we are, as a nation, proud of being a melting pot. And in all probability, I think we're best described as a tossed mixed salad. We're all together in the same bowl, but we're not interacting with each other very much at all. What I've seen in the last couple of days is an understanding that the things that separate us, the things that render one community invisible to another, are the things that have made it possible for us to decide that the best way to control life in neighborhoods like the one in Newark where those riots erupted is to have the police serve as the controlling force that determines what happens and how. That all these uh, interactions, all these social structures, all the things that keep ghettoized communities in place, all the things that maintain segregation in the United States, even in the year 2020, are also the things that we're seeing with, for example, the pandemic of COVID-19. And my thought has always been that what we need to do is recognize how much the social structures and the social inequalities that are creating 
ghettoized communities are also the things that are making it necessary for folk in the most advantaged communities to pay attention. COVID-19 did one great service to all of us. It demonstrated that, you know, you are not because of your wealth, because of your privilege, and because of your power, so separated from the health of people in minority communities that what affects their health may also affect yours. When the, the Prime Minister of England became sick with COVID-19, it became clear. We may be suffering the most with all of this, but we're the ones who are in this together. We're all being impacted by the impact of structural racism. And I'm hoping that in a session like this, this is where we really get to talk about these issues and think about solutions. Mm. Yeah, and I just want to remind all of you who are, who are here watching, and thank you so much for joining us um, today. Don't forget that you can ask questions if you didn't submit a question earlier, or even if you did. Um, this, the purpose of this town hall is for Bob and Jude to, uh, to answer your questions um, and for this to be the start of a dialogue. Um, so Bob, you already mentioned COVID-19 and um, some of the impact it's had on us. So would you say, would you say that this is a, a special moment? Is it, what it, what is, why do you think it is now that people are so driven to make change? I'm a professor in a school of public health. Alan Rosenfield, who was uh, the late dean of the School of Public Health before it became the Mailman School of Public Health, used to just be enraged when every other year a poll would be released that indicated that the average American had no idea what public health is all about. Well, all of a sudden, everybody knows what public health is because it's determining so much of the nature of your daily interactions with life, with your neighborhood, with your surroundings. So this is a unique moment where we get to point out that one of the most important lessons in public health is at no point in time should you ever let a reservoir of infection go untreated. COVID-19 centered itself in poor communities of color because it took advantage of all the health disparities that exist there in such dramatic proportions that it leaked out, so to speak, because the folk who lived in communities that were impacted were also the folk who had essential jobs, meant that the sometimes invisible connections between rich communities and poor communities were joined in many interesting ways and put us all at risk. Not the same level of risk, but at risk nonetheless. I think this is a, a unique teaching moment because it's the moment when we get to say, see, when we talked about public health, when we said it's important to take care of this, this is what we meant. Now that y'all see it, what are we gonna do about it? At least that's my hope. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I really see that as well. And Jide, I'd like to I'd like to bring you into the conversation here, um, since we've moved to a public health. Um, I, yeah, Bob already mentioned a couple of ways in which um, a minority of people carry the major burden of of the cost of healthcare, the weight of the weight of health problems. Um, and uh, I wondered if you could expand for us on why, why is that? Why is it that our black communities and our Latinx communities bear that cost so heavily? Well, thanks for the question, um, Paula. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Kamara Jones, who, um, who is a real legend um, in, the, in the field of public health, especially as it results to, as a, as a as it relates to racism and structural racism. And, and she uses this uh, cliff uh, analogy that I just want to use to highlight uh, my answer to your question. And so if a person is walking towards the edge of a cliff and falls over, what can we do to help? We can station an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and rush that person to the hospital for emergency medical treatment. We can put a net halfway down that catches the person while falling and hope he or she doesn't fall through the cracks. We can put a fence at the edge of the cliff to prevent the person from falling and hope that that fence doesn't break from the sheer number of people it has to stop from falling. Or we can move the person far away from the edge of the cliff so that he or she is no longer at risk from falling. The first scenario with the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff is what we call tertiary prevention. The second scenario with the net trying to catch individuals who have already fallen um, is called secondary prevention. And, and that's the uh, type of things that we do with screening, blood pressure screening, annual physicals, 
even cancer screenings, et cetera. And the third scenario, which is the fence stopping the falls, uh, that's what we refer to as primary prevention. And examples are immunization, for example. The fourth scenario, which is moving the person far away from the edge of that cliff is what we call primordial prevention. And this is where the social determinants of health come in. This is why your zip code determines your life expectancy in this country by as much as 30 years. And the social determinants of health are really conditions in the environment in which people are born, live, work, play, and worship that affect our health and wellness. But, but you know, we can view this cliff analogy one dimensionally and then really miss the issues that Bob has raised, which are the issues of structural racism. Um, because the truth is, in many cases, Paula, there are certain groups of people who are likely to have no ambulance at all. Their, their net is likely to be torn and ripped. The fence is likely to be broken even though they live closest to the edge. And these are the reasons for the disparities uh, that you've just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, thank you, thank you for that. And, and, and I know from, from talking to you in the past, from, from, from some of my own understanding that, that there are physical health manifestations of living on that edge with that ripped net underneath you. Um, and, and I wondered if you could speak to some of those real physical and health um, uh, manifestations of, of structural racism and inequality. I mean, I'll just uh, begin by, by, by saying that um, and emphasizing that racism really does affect our bodies. Um, you know, there, there are numerous studies out there that have shown uh, that racism has true physiological effects. Um, it is damaging to our bodies. Uh, just a, a, an example is, uh, I'll just mention one study that looked at um, everyday discrimination, you know, the, the, the daily injustices, the microaggressions. Um, uh, and they, they, saw, they showed that a high endorsement of everyday discrimination is significantly associated with less dipping of your blood pressure when you're sleeping at night. So when, men, when most humans sleep, their blood pressure falls at night by about 10%. Um, there's a category of individuals that we refer to as non-dippers. Uh, those are individuals whose blood where their blood pressure doesn't fall. And there, there, are certain, there are certain risks uh, that we know that are associated with non-dipping, uh, like high BMIs, but we've also seen socioeconomic status uh, um, affect uh, non-dipping. But one of the things that's been emerging and being shown over and over again is the effect of these daily injustices, the effect of discrimination on non-dipping. And so it's been shown that black individuals uh, those who have received chronic racial discrimination, their blood pressure doesn't fall by that 10%. It needs to fall when we are sleeping. Um, and and this, this non-dipping of your blood pressure is associated with cardiovascular uh, mortality and, and cardiovascular morbidity. Um, you know, the, the, the chronic discrimination um, is a risk factor for hypertension, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, even stroke, I can go on and on and on. But it also causes mental health diseases and both of these interact with each other. We see high rates of anxiety disorders, depression, delusions and hallucinations, post-traumatic stress disorder, difficulty coping or adapting to severe events. Just think of COVID and the mental health effects of that as it disproportionately affects communities of color, living in fear, lack of trust because of all the broken promises, rumination, uh, emotional dysregulation, and the worst of all is hopelessness. And so yes, uh, structural racism, racism can have devastating effects on the bodies of black and white adults and black, uh, on black adults and black children 
uh, and all those among us who have experienced uh, daily, the daily assault of, of discrimination. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's a sobering, so that was my nervous laugh because it's so sobering to think about just the, the scale of this. Um, and, and you co-founded co a wellness center right here in Harlem, Columbia University. Um, our community is, is embedded in another community, as it were. We're right in the middle of Harlem. Um, what, what do you think are the particular challenges that our local community are facing right now? Well, I, I think um, they are ex experiencing great trauma, Paula. Um, you know, we, 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 would, we would speak, we were, uh, I'll go back and just quote a, uh, a study, because I think this is important. Um, there was a study that was published in The Lancet uh, by Jacob Bohr and his colleagues, which, which showed that, that police killings of unarmed Black Americans have adverse effects on the mental health of Black Americans and the general population. Uh, and this included depression, severe anxiety, and the largest effects on mental health occurred as far out as three months after the event. And but it was it was it was uh, most acute in the first first two months after the event. Uh, and then the researchers also showed that the that there were no significant effects for respondents interviewed before police killings. Um, they also showed that the mental health impacts were not. Uh, were not observed among white respondents and resulted only from police killings of unarmed black Americans, not unarmed white Americans or armed black Americans. But, but then when you add um, the COVID pandemic disparities to this rearing of its head, uh, what we saw with George Floyd, uh, when you, we, were, we were still just adjusting to the to the onslaught uh, of emotional, uh, 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 you know, dysregulation just because of the, the, the deaths that we were disproportionately experiencing uh, in the Black community from COVID. And then we see this ugly, despicable act that we are all too familiar with in the Black community of, uh, with what happened to George Floyd. Uh, and then you can answer the question yourself, uh, what do you think uh, that the black community is going through right now? What do you really think we are going through? Yeah, and the truth is, the truth is, I can't, I can't imagine, but I must try. Um, and you know, I think, I think that that this is something that we all have to think about. Um, so I want, to, uh, I want to move the conversation a little bit um, in the direction um, of what we can do and how we can, how we can start to, and it sort of horrifies me to say start to, but I think that this is an opportunity for us to really start to do work. Um, how can we start to address um, the bias, the racism, the structural inequalities in our system. Um, so Bob, maybe I'll ask you first to talk about, uh, you know, at the societal level, um, what we might do, and then Gide, I'll pass it to you to talk about the health, um, the work in, in health that we might do. What I think fascinates me most is all the discourse that's arisen around defunding the police. On the one hand, people think, what, you're gonna get rid of the police altogether? No, that's not what's being recommended. What has been true for police representatives themselves is the notion that for years, they've been asked to do too much. Got a problem with homelessness? Well, instead of finding a way to provide affordable housing, we ask the police to take care of all the homeless folk who get rowdy. Got a problem with mental illness? Well, instead of funding appropriate mental health interventions, expanding the scope of care that we provide for those individuals. We ask the cops to make sure that the homeless folk and the, mental, and the folk who are struggling with mental illness, we ask them to deal with those folks who become socially problematic, who are not able to behave appropriately and take them out of sight, out of mind, put them in a jail, put them in a prison somewhere. 
Defunding the police is a recognition that what we're asking the police to do is control a bunch of social problems that we don't want to invest in fixing. So where's the point where we can start to change our thinking? If much of what we're asking the police to do arises from our struggling, our issues related to everything from homelessness to unemployment to lack of education to high rates of crime, how about investing in solutions instead of investing in having an occupied army that's gonna be responsible for managing that which we don't wanna see and that which we don't wanna hear about. Once again, COVID-19 has been a unique opportunity for us to rethink the way in which we organize, certainly urban life. And part of what I think has to occur with this reorganization is to rethink how it is that we're gonna take the one big and often the biggest budget item in most urban areas budget, how much we pay for cops, and think about allocating it as a way of thinking about and approaching something that looks like solutions. On the big picture, I think that's where I'd start. Thank you, yeah. Um, and Jide, would you like to, to add some thoughts about what we can do at the health the healthcare level or the health disparity level, perhaps? Sure, sure. Well, I completely agree with, with, with what Bob just said um, um, about you know, the societal things. Uh, again, back to the social determinants of health. Um, I think that it will be really important to structure our interventions um, or, and our efforts around these social determinants of health. I talked about living far away from the edge of a cliff. And th there are five big pillars uh, that are the uh, five big social determinants of health that I think need to be addressed. And, and the first is, is education. You know, Bob, uh, you know, can probably spend, and I can spend, uh, you know, hours talking about uh, the inequity in, in our educational system. But I think education is one of those social determinants that we need to look at more critically as a society. The second is healthcare access um, um, and, and, and healthcare injustice. Um, I think that's a very important area that we also need to really pay attention to. And, and I think MYP and Columbia have a, a great opportunity to lead uh, in that space. Uh, the third is economic stability. You know, there's great, great economic injustice that I cannot even begin to, to talk about. And this piece is a critical piece, uh, economic injustice. You know, you know, black wealth has been stagnant um, for, you know, 70 years. Um, and, and the truth is, the studies have shown that attending college hasn't been able to mitigate this wealth, wealth gap. And that's really, again, related to the structural racism that exists. But economic injustice is critically important, social determinant of health. The next is, is, is the neighborhood and the built environment. You just have to stroll through some of our Black neighborhoods to understand uh, what I'm talking about. And, and the, 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 the fifth um, is the social and the community context. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to develop strategies around these social determinants. But first, we have to understand what racism is. Um, and, 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 and I like, again, going back to Dr. Jones, you know, she's kind of divided it, not just structural racism, because certainly institutionalized and structural racism is a big part, but there's also personally mediated uh, racism. And that's what most people kind of think of when they hear the word racism. You know, those are the prejudice, uh, the, just as the discrimination, uh, the assumptions, the differential assumptions about the abilities of a black person um, or the motives of a black person uh, just based on his race. Uh, these personally mediated racism, you know, again, that falls into the whole bias, implicit and explicit bias uh, category and how we need strategies to address that. Uh, and then there's internalized racism, which is really one of the most heartbreaking of all uh, that I'm not really gonna talk about now. But with regards to Columbia University and MYP, with regards to the structural racism um, that we need to weed out, we need to root out. And I have to preface by saying, I, I think Columbia has, has made great strides over the time I've been here in addressing a lot of these community needs and really trying to promote diversity and equity and inclusion. But there's still a long way to go. Um, I think that it's gonna be very important for us to to look at our hiring practices. I think it's important to look at our promotion and tenure practices. I think it's important to look at our disciplinary practices for those, um, for, for racial complaints, for complaints of racism. 
uh, I think it's important to, for us to really look at our diversity and inclusion practices. And, and you know, we've, we've done a great job with women and, fo and, and focusing on the diversity around improving how we uh, include women. But, but quite frankly, I'd like to see much more around underrepresented minorities. Um, and then again, Columbia's done I mean, just the fact that I have a, I, I'm, I'm leading a wellness center at the Zuckerman just shows Columbia's commitment to the, to the community. Uh, but I still think there is work to be done, much more work to be done with our community relations. Uh, and those are just some ideas uh, of, of places that we can begin to think about uh, building strategies around. Yeah, thank you so much, Annette. And that reminds me of a, one of the pre-submitted audience questions we received where somebody asked, and I, this might be a rhetorical question really, but what, how can we work towards diversity, equity, inclusivity, and access at this institution when we don't have the ability to record the transgressions that are occurring in work? Um, and I don't know if either of you have an answer to how we do that when we don't have the ability as, other than to say what you said already today, which is that we should have that ability. Maybe I can add another historical note. I joined the faculty of the medical center here in January of 1990. So I'm in my 31st year. My history of being here has been a history in which amongst other things, every time an event like what has just happened in Minneapolis occurs, every time we have a sense that, oh my God, we need to look at ourselves because a lot of racism is present in what we do. A lot of racism is present in the nature of our hiring and interactions. And what is it that we do? Well, we do what most academic centers do. We create committees. We create a task force. It'll work for 18 months. It'll look carefully at the situation. It will list all the things that we do wrong. It'll make strong recommendations for what we can do right. But 18 months will have passed and the urgency of the moment will have subsided. Oh, we still dealing with that? I thought we were done. So they'll sit on someone's shelf and they'll gather dust until the next event, the next cop killing rages throughout the United States, arouses huge levels of indignation. And we think, okay, we've got to do something now. I just worry that part of what happens, you'll see is that I'm a guy, as I said in the beginning, who lived through the riots in Newark in 1967. When the Kerner Commission, the commission that President Johnson put together to look at rioting in urban America in the 1964, 1968 period, they made detailed recommendations that sound a lot like what we're saying has to be done today. Kenneth Clark, famous African-American sociologist, said, you know, I read the report and it looked just like the report we issued after 1919 with the Tulsa riots. It looked just like the ones that we did in 1943 after Detroit. I could go on and on and on, but what Ken said is, we keep doing the same thing over and over again. We keep finding the same problems. We commit ourselves with each instance to do better, and then we forget. So maybe the most important thing is to say that whatever we do in response, maybe we have to do more than just study it and make recommendations. Maybe up front we have to commit to act. I don't know what actions will be taken when we study the problem more in depth, but hey, we're well educated. We're scientists. We know how to do this stuff. So I have every reason to believe that we'll identify the things that we should change. What's necessary is not an identification of what's wrong. It's developing the political will to do something about it. I just want to add to, I want to add to what Bob has said, because I think that is that is, he touches on a very, really, really important issue. And, and that, is, um, that is hope. Um, and, you know, to, to be honest with you, we have seen um, these discussions we've, for years and decades and decades and decades. There have been marches, there have been protests, uh, there has been pain, mothers have lost children, as, uh, communities have been dead. We've seen this over and over and over again. And every time these commissions are put together and people come up with plans and strategies, we hold our breath and we ask, should we be hopeful this time around? And nothing happens. And our hearts are broken. And so we're scared. I personally am scared to have hope because I don't know if, if all what we're seeing today will truly translate into meaningful change, meaningful structural change, even if it's just incremental, a step in the right direction. 
that would be tremendous, is even if we can have incremental change. I have been encouraged by some changes that I've seen, even right here um, uh, um, in, in this organization, but I am very concerned uh, that this might not be sustained. And, and I just want to say one other thing before I stop, is that the, the, the key to change is not going to come from Bob and I. We can make recommendations, we can join task forces, we can give a thousand town hall meetings. If we don't have the buy-in, the allyship of white America, if we don't have them on the front lines of this battle, we will never see the type of changes that need to happen. You know, the mayor of Atlanta said the other day that for every, for the, for, for every minute of the nine minutes that George Floyd was held down by that knee, for every minute of life seeping out of him, we should commit, all of us, to find nine recommendations that we want to see change in our immediate environments, in our homes, in our places of work, and we should try to force that change through. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, um, there's a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch over to some more of the audience questions now, if I may, and I'm trying to put them in order in my mind of importance and <laughs> urgency, and I'm sure I'm not going to do, do that justice, but I, I just wanna say again that I really, I really appreciate um, the thousand town halls that you're doing and a chance for us to learn. Um, and one of the audience questions um, is, um, is about the difference, is there a difference? And what is the difference between structural racism and systemic racism? Um, and another question added, institutional racism. Um, so for those of us who haven't learned what those things are, what, what are the differences between those types of racism? And, uh, and I guess I'll add my own question to that. Does it matter? Does it just matter that we know about them and we name them? Well, I mean, I can just say that structural and institutionalized racism is really the same thing. Um, structural or, or institutionalized racism is def really defined as differential access to goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. Um, it, it's structural having been codified in our customs, in our practices, in our policies. So that, you know, there doesn't need to be an identifiable perpetrator. Um, mm -hmm with structural racism. It's a systemic issue. Um, personally mediated race racism is really defined as the prejudice and discrimination, uh, where prejudice means the differential assumptions about the abilities of, uh, and intentions of other, of other people according to their race. Uh, and then there's um, internalized racism. Is really, uh, uh, it's really an effect uh, of, of racism where individuals um, uh, basically uh, discriminate um, against themselves uh, because of the conditioning that society has, has created uh, in them. And that, that goes back to the doll experiment that, uh, that, that I believe I mentioned uh, recently where you had young kids age three to, to seven, actually it was done at Columbia, um, the doll experiment. Uh, young kids age three to seven, uh, Kenneth and, and Mamie Clark did the experiment and and as Sidney Hankerson reminded me the other day, this experiment uh, was actually a testament, used as testimony of Brown in, in the Brown versus a Board of Ed that ultimately led uh, to desegregation of the schools. And it was done at, at Columbia. And they basically 250 uh, children, black children, and they, they asked them to identify, um, they had a white, and a, black, a white doll and a black doll and they asked them to identify which doll is good, which doll is bad. Uh, m you know, majority of the black kids uh, said that the black doll was bad and the white doll was good. And then they were asked to point to which doll looks like them. Uh, and they, most of them broke down crying inconsolab unconsolably, 
Uh, the author described it as convulsive crying. A lot of the kids ran out of the room. That's internalized. Uh, that's the, that, those are the roots of internalized racism. So, so there are different levels of racism. But, but I think that for, for our purposes, I think structural racism, the systemic racism, the denial of opportunities uh, to folks just based on the color of their skin occurs at every level uh, in, in, in American society. I think that is what has caused the most harm uh, to us um, um, you know, in, in this country. Um, and and it's, it's, it interacts with personally mediated and it interacts with internalized racism. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that um, study as well. Um, there's a question here about the NIH. Um, uh, it says, does, does the NIH's focus on basic biological research rather than epidemiological research and public health contribute to social determinants of health outcomes? So should we be pressuring the NIH to increase funding for research and policy that directly affects communities rather than focusing solely on, on these abstract biological principles? Can I add that uh, I'm not someone despite having a father and a grandfather and an ex-wife who are physicians. My doctorate is in education. So, I mean, I, I think what I've seen more than anything else is how much and to what degree the whole question of how we approach NIH has often been a function of the fact that we have never in this nation wanted to have a federal agency using taxpayer dollars finance the revolution. I started work with HIV AIDS in 1986. My dad, with this odd last name of ours, full of love, was a, was a urologist, board certified, was an expert in gonorrhea and syphilis. So when I started doing HIV research, he said, ah, getting into the family business, are you? But what we quickly discovered is me with my community organizing background really learned that when you started to talk about the social determinants of health, the federal government is very lax when it comes to saying we should use federal dollars to change the conditions that expose people to HIV. So I think what has always been the case has been that yes, they will acknowledge that these things exist. What's not clear is whether or not their mandate is to go from what they narrowly describe and define as medicine to something that looks like it should belong in another compartment of government, uh, health and housing, um, education, what have you. The minute you start to cite those things as factors, my experience as a guy who used to be a program officer with a federal government grant making or agency, my notion is that no, we're gonna to stick to something that is rather fundamental. We will stay aware from, stay away, excuse me, from the social. And we'll leave that to other agencies, other foundations, other parts of government to deal with that. So much as I think uh, we'd like to change that, my experience of 30 some odd years working with HIV is that AIH is going to say, thank you very much, but not really. So, you know, maybe you've got a different notion. No, no, I, I, I agree. But I, I just want to uh, talk about a study, uh, I believe that was done by an author with the name, um, I believe her name was Hope. Um, and um, she, she, there was a study that was commissioned eight years ago uh, by the NIH, um, which showed that although proposals with strong priority scores were equally likely to be funded, regardless of race, after controlling for, you know, the applicants, the background, black participants remain 10 percentage points less likely uh, than whites to be awarded NIH funding. And so this led to a, a, a 10, um, 10, um, to a 10-year, $500 million initiative to improve the situation. Um, but despite these efforts, um, there remains a lower rate of NIH uh, of funding uh, for R01 applications as submitted by Black uh, scientists relative to white scientists. Uh, and so to, un to, to identify the underlying causes of this funding gap, the NIH commissioned um, a follow-up study uh, and they analyzed six stages of the application process. Um, they, they looked at, and this was between 2011 and 2015, and they, and they found that there were dis the disparate outcomes arising from three of these six areas. First was the decision to discuss 
the proposal. The second was the impact score assignment. And the third, which was a previously kind of understudied stage was the issue of topic choice. So they found that, that black applicants um, tended to propose research on topics with lower award rates. And the most common uh, of these topics were, was research done at the community level, um, um, as opposed to you know, more fundamental mechanistic uh, uh, research. Um, and the latter of which tended to, to, to have higher award rates. And, uh, it, it, but in, the, in fact, this topic choice alone accounted for 20% uh, of the funding gap after adjusting for multiple variables, uh, including the applicant's prior achievement. So, so there is bias um, um, in, in the NIH uh, funding process. And these are some of the structural issues that also need to be addressed. Yes. Yeah. And I think, I think this, this is, this is part of something that builds into, to a huge problem that we have, which is, which is how to, how to promote and support and recruit, but also, but also support and nurture um, black faculty members. And I think that that's a question that a lot of us in academia are grappling with right now is how can we how can we increase the number and strengthen the number of black and, and people of color um, academics among our own ranks um, you know especially if they're facing things like um, just having a lower rate of NIH funding because of what they study I just want to comment that Columbia has been doing some great work in this area. Hilda Hutchison has been doing some great work in terms of pipeline programming for, 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 for high school students. And, and Andrew Marks actually um, has also done with his, with his spur program, has done some great work. Um, so there have been some great work that's been done. Um, you know, Hilda has been attending a lot of minority conferences uh, uh, where there are college graduates trying to recruit folks uh, uh, um, into uh, the medical field, for example. Uh, so th there, there are, there's a lot of work that's been done to try to, you know, build up our pipeline programs, better outreach to, to communities of color through venues that they attend. Uh, but I just think that uh, we need to do uh, much more of it. We need to quadruple these efforts um, and do it in a way that's coordinated across our entire campus. Yeah. Yeah, Bob, do you want to add to that? And, you know, that's where I was before I started doing public health research. I won't go into a history of uh, my own career, but I, I am aware of the fact that if you look at all of the programs that have been in place since the 1960s that have been successful, in increasing the number of minority graduates in every area imaginable of science and may I even say uh, health. What has always been the case is it's not that we don't know how to do this. What I think the problem has always been is that we want this to be funded by grants and contracts and not by money that institutions themselves use to finance the things that they believe to be essential. As a former program officer, I'm really clear that what we in public health and medicine often have is a dependence on grant funding. If you can't get the cash, you don't do it. And as a consequence, when we do get the cash, then many of us are in careers where every four years you're struggling to maintain something that can only be supported with grant funds, only to see it disappear because all of a sudden there's been a change in the administration in Washington, wink, 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 and what was a priority a couple of years ago is now something that people don't even know how to describe or pronounce. So I, I think the idea that when we start talking about how can we change this by looking at the ways in which we do external funding, as a former program officer, I'm the guy who has to tell you, y'all got to go into recovery. As long as you make it dependent on the whims of who's in the White House, for example, Efforts like this are going to suffer. I don't need to spell this out. I hope this is a learned audience. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. At some levels, don't look to the NIH. Figure out what you can do with your own income. Make it institutional. Don't make it a function that has to support itself with what you get 
from the outside and see then, if because you're spending your own money, you don't become committed to some of the changes that you decide to make. I'm 76 years old. I've been watching this for a long, long time. So if nothing else, I would like my age to be a way in which we understand how much the weight of what I'm saying really does help us figure out what we should be doing in the future. That's at least my hope. I'm trying my best to hold my applause, but I couldn't agree, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I, I really couldn't. We, we, have to, we have to look to ourselves to solve this problem. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to bring it um, back to our community. Um, and um, there's a couple of questions um, that we've received about how we can see our neighbors um, and be a good partner to them. Um, and how we can build trust with um, our local community and, and, with, and with black communities who've historically been so mistreated by our medical institutions. I know that's a huge conglomeration of questions, but if you could speak to any part of that, I'd be grateful. Well, I'm the guy who's the Dean for Community and Minority Affairs. Uh, bless his heart, Alan Rosenfield, appointed me to this deanship in 1991. And part of what I always like to think about as a, sort of a driving force in his brilliance was the notion that he gave me a lot of political and cultural capital, but he didn't give me a budget and he didn't give me a staff. I'm just like I was in Mississippi in 1964. I'm all about community organizing. So this Saturday with two of our elected officials, here in Washington Heights, I live right on 169th Street. I'm between Broadway on the one hand and Fort Washington on the other. I took a walk with uh, our assemblyman, uh, Al Taylor, and with our state senator, Robert Jackson. And we walked around Washington Heights to look at what has happened since COVID-19 descended on this community. Here's what I know that a lot of people aren't talking about is they think about economic recovery and they think about what we're gonna do with all the healthcare disruptions that we experienced. It was food insecurity. I was with coach David Crenshaw, somebody who's been in the public schools here for more than 20 years. He had his students make sandwiches that they were passing out as we walked up and down the street. We went to the food distribution center on 159th street. There was a block two blocks long. There was a line two blocks long just to get access to food because so many people lost their jobs. I don't need to go through all the things that have happened. Let me be clear. What I'm saying is not a request for charity. Don't throw money at the Red Cross or someone else because I think what is often missing is that we study these problems from a distance. We pay people to go out in the community to tell us what's going on. And what is often so absent, what makes community-based research so difficult is that the engagement is always through secondary individuals, somebody you hire from the community who serves as a guide, who lets you see what's going on and who gives you access to all the gatekeepers who make it possible for us to do the surveys, get the data, or provide access to medical care. Once again, things that often only last for the duration of a grant. What I think is ne needed more than anything else is people being personally present at moments when we're not only trying to do something to confront a crisis of the type that's been created by COVID-19, if I can use my preacher voice, we make personal witness about what's going on. It's our absence in the physical manifestations of this that I think strikes people most. We are surrounded by communities where interpersonal reaction and interpersonal interaction is the basic way in which social contracts are made and solidified. Uh, we don't do these things at a distance. So part of what I think people have to resolve to do is not work through intermediaries. You want to make personal witness. You want to make a difference. You want to change all of this. Be present. Be present in person, not necessarily through representatives. I, I think that's one of the ways in which we create a true community. We, we stop speaking about them and we start using language that in includes a lot of work and a lot of words like us. Let me stop there. You know, um, Paula, you know, um, I, I really want to just emphasize what Bob said about proximity. You know, one of the, the best ways to reduce bias is just get to know the person. Uh, uh, you know, get to know them, you know, not superficially, uh, but, you know, in terms of really 
you know the, who, what their children's names are? Um, have you been to their homes? You know, how many uh, people of color, of how many black individuals are in your wedding album, right? Get, get to know them. Uh, and, and the other thing I want to say, and I'm, I'll just, I'm going to be very brief, um, and, and I just want to emphasize that proximity does reduce bias, and that's been shown over and over again. The problem is that we're too segregated. Uh, and we need to be more integrated. And there's great data on integration really helping to further and uh, further equity and reduce inequity. There's one other thing I want to mention, though, and I think this is important. There's a tendency for, for a group of people, especially privileged individuals, and I understand the, you know, some people don't think they're privileged, but relative to, to, to Black America, trust me, white America is privileged. Uh, but there's a tendency to, to look at people who are poor and marginalized and ask, what is wrong with them? Why can't they pull themselves up by their bootstraps? But the question um, we should ask is not what is wrong with them, but what happened to them? And why don't they have any boots? Those are the real questions. And, and that's how the whole concept of trauma-informed care emerged. And that's the re, re, um, reframing, that's the paradigm shift that we need to make within our consciousness. Um, and that in itself, if we can arrive at that question, uh, we will see a, a, we'll see the clarity, uh, we'll have much more clarity when, when, when we're interacting with each other. Yes. Um, we only have a few minutes left, um, and um, I just don't, I don't have anything to add that could possibly be more expressive or compelling than what both of you have shared with us today. Um, but I want to thank you both again um, on behalf of the whole community. We had 342 participants in this meeting. Um, we had so many questions that I wasn't able to relay. Um, I read them all and I tried to do my best to get as many in as possible. I think you both answered them incredibly. Um, this presentation will be recorded um, and the link will be distributed um, so that it can be shared more widely. Um, I, um, I'm so glad that we could have this time together. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you all so much uh, for, uh, for participating and especially thank you, Bob and Gide, for suggesting this town hall and for executing it. And thank you, Paula, I know these are tough times to moderate a conversation like this. This was truly breathtaking and, and uh, uh, we have learned a lot. And, and we should let this sink in, but we should act. As we've heard, we need to go beyond committees and task forces and build structures that last, that outlast me, outlast anyone that is here. We need to put money, as Bob said, we need to pay the staff, not just appoint people, um, just um, honorarily. And so this should outlast each of us. And we need accountability, and I'm here to say that I'm accountable. So if nothing changes, I am accountable, and I should not be in this job. We need to change the power structures, and we need to change the visibility of everyone that's doing the work, not only faculty. And for these, I would like to ask, please, Rimel, can you show up the videos of everyone? I know this was not planned but I think we need to see everyone that's involved in organizing this uh, event. Can you please let everyone's videos come online from Rimel, Marjorie, Abhishek, Paula, Bob, Kelly. We already miss Bob and G-Day because they went along. So, I just wanted to, and, and, and Rimel yourself maybe, and Bob is still here, 
strategy they have to go run this if we can show everyone um, because there are faces uh, behind every event we i you know i show up as a, a person that is um trying to leave this institution but these plus g they were the people that were behind working to make sure this work and that have worked a lot so if we don't solve this where one shows up to look good and the others are doing the work if we if we don't change this we're we're doomed so i want to thank you guys and give you the proper credit for doing this um the last thing is this means that we need everyone on board look the we've failed so many times that this can be another conversation so changing structurally may imply being radical as uh, you know gee they know so uh, we've spoke about uh, but it will it may be a long process but we need everyone involved and and so please join our effort we need to put our money where our mouth is but we also need to show up as as bob said physically to this task so i invite you all to change this effort and i have to thank this team for the amazing job today thank you all and see you soon thank you